Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see your faces. Would you stand with us in worship? Yeah, I was buried, but my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tune Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the dark worshiping with us this morning.
God, God had chosen Abraham, Abraham to be the father, father of a large family, family. a great, a great nation, nation through whom God, God would bless the entire, the entire world. Abraham, Abraham was 75, 75 years old when he obeyed God's, God's call to go to, go to a new land. land. 
He left, he left his, his home in Haran, in Haran with his, with his wife, wife Sarah, Sarah, his nephew, nephew Lot, Lot, and all, and of, all of his possessions, possessions and servants. servants. They, traveled they traveled to the land, to the land of, Canaan. of Canaan. God, God reminded, reminded Abraham, Abraham of his, of his promise. promise. Abraham, Abraham and Lot, and Lot moved, moved throughout, throughout the, land. the land. Finally, Finally Abraham, Abraham decided, decided to separate from, from his nephew, nephew Lot, Lot, because, because the, the land could not support, support all of their, all of their people, people and animals, animals at the same time. So Lot chose where he would live near a city called Sodom. And Abraham, Abraham went, went to Hebron. Hebron. In those, in those days, days, four kings, kings in the area, area got, together got together and fought, and fought a war against, against five, five other kings, kings including, including the king of Sodom, where Lot, Lot lived. In the, in end, the end, the four, the four kings, kings won against, against the, five. the five. Their, Their armies, armies took, took everything, everything, all the all goods, goods and, and people, from the, from the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The kings, the kings even captured, captured Lot, Lot and then and went on, on their way. One survivor found Abraham and told him what had happened. Abraham, Abraham gathered, gathered together 318 men, men, and they and went they after, after the four, the four kings. kings. Abraham's, Abraham's small, small army attacked, attacked the kings, the kings and, their and their armies, armies at night, night defeated, defeated them, and chased, and chased them off. Abraham, Abraham brought, brought back Lot, Lot many, many possessions, possessions, and also, and also many, many people. When Abraham, when Abraham returned, returned from the from battle, battle, Melchizedek, Melchizedek the, king the king of Salem, Salem came, came to Abraham. To Abraham. Melchizedek, Melchizedek was, a, was priest a priest to God, God Most, Most High. High. Melchizedek, Melchizedek blessed, blessed Abraham, Abraham and said, God, God has blessed, blessed Abraham. Abraham. Let, Let everyone, everyone bless, bless God, God who, created who created heaven, heaven and earth, and earth because, because he has handed, handed over, over Abraham's, Abraham's enemies. enemies. Then, then Abraham, Abraham gave, gave Melchizedek, Melchizedek a gift, a gift. One, one tenth, tenth of everything, everything he had. He had. You never know with these videos. Sometimes they play when I'm already up here, so it's like, you have to be really cautious. <laughs> Last thing I want to do is be up here and the video starts playing and then I just go pie on my face. Good morning, everyone. Welcome here to Territorial Drive Alliance Church. My name is Pastor Nathan. Welcome to everyone here, both in person as well as those of you joining us online. And happy Thanksgiving weekend. Hope that you have an incredible weekend. Welcome to all of you who are here visiting. Uh, you're up in North Battleford for Thanksgiving, visiting family. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, and as well, those who have traveled and are joining us online who normally attend regularly here on a Sunday. Hope you are having an incredible Thanksgiving weekend, wherever it is you are. Uh, we have a couple of quick announcements. Um, this Friday on October 13th, Indoor Playground is back. Indoor Playground is for children five and under. It is at the church in the gym from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. It's a really cool ministry uh, for parents to bring their children. Their children run around, and there's a lot of intentional discipleship So, uh, between the parents. So if you have kids that are five and under... Uh, feel free, join us in the gym. You can talk to, I think Alessa's not here, so talk to Rachel Hodgman, our children's ministry director. And if you know people who have kids five and under and they're just sick and tired of having their kids at home, especially now that the weather's getting cold, let them know about our indoor playground. It's a really cool ministry that we are really happy uh, to run here. Um, it is shoebox season, right? We are so excited. Shoeboxes are back, and we as a church are passionate about shoeboxes and reaching and blessing so many kids around the world. So we have a quick video about shoeboxes, and then I'll come back up and do a little bit more talking about them. shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about his son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children disciple, and we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes, thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes.
Wonderful. So, yes. So we as a church, we have shoeboxes. Uh, they are right by the door. So we encourage you as a family, grab some shoeboxes, Make it a family event, a family tradition. I know there's already a ton of families in this church who do that. They grab a bunch of shoeboxes and they fill them up. Uh, So we encourage you to do that. Uh, Our collection week is November 13th to 19th. That's when those get uh, dropped back in. And maybe uh, you aren't able to pack any shoeboxes at Awana. We do a big shoebox packing party for all the kids because we think it's so important for the kids of our church and the kids of our community to be involved and think about kids in other nations and how they can actually be a light and be an impact to those. So we are accepting any donations for those kids at Awana to pack. So I think online you can find a list. I sent out an email to all the Awana parents about what you can and cannot bring. If you are interested in donating to bless uh, Awana um, so that the Awana kids can pack, uh, just talk to me or you can bring it in. There's a container right next to the shoebox table. But in all things church, let's make sure we're praying for this. And we're going to keep mentioning shoeboxes because we think it's just such an important ministry, such a unique and impactful way to reach the nations, right? To um, show kids that they are loved by these churches in countries far away from them and that we're doing it because of Jesus, right? And these kids can firsthand experience the love of Jesus through something like a shoebox. So I encourage you, As a family, as an individual, pack some shoeboxes. If you're not able to, uh, we take any donations so that the Iwana kids are able to do that as well. Um, So kids, today, the four to six, we are having a grade four to six classroom that will be up in the youth room. Um, Thank you to all of our volunteers for kids ministry. We can always use more volunteers. So if you are interested in volunteering for kids ministry, uh, please talk to one of the staff, Rachel especially, because we could always use volunteers for that. So grade four to sixes are up in the youth room. If you don't know where that is, you can ask Rachel in the foyer or just follow the crowd of kids who look around your age. Um, K to three is in the big room and then the pre-K room. If you did not get a label, uh, they are available available at the registration table. They were printed during the service. The printer was having some issues, but they're ready to go. So I'm going to pray for our kids and then they will be dismissed. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the kids of our church. May they learn about how incredible you are and how incredible your love for them is. May you impact them through your word, through the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. Be with each of our teachers and volunteers. Give them words to say. May they be able to show your love to each of the kids here. I ask that you bless this service, bless our kids, and they have an incredible morning today. Your name, amen. All right, so kids, you are dismissed. All right, and a couple more quick announcements before Pastor Keith comes up for the message. Um, Our fellowship lunch is not after the service today on account of it being Thanksgiving weekend. It's next week. So just if there's any confusion with that, we're going to have an awesome lunch after the service next week. Hope you're looking forward to that. Um, At the back of your pews are connection cards. We encourage you. We would love to connect with you, especially if for those of you who are new to this church, new to the community, haven't been to the church in a while, or you have been to the church for quite a while, but you want to get more connected, feel free to fill those out, and then you can either and you can either put them back into the info center or just drop them off in the offering box. Um, if anyone's interested in baptism, uh, talk to myself, Pastor Keith, Pastor Dirk, or you can fill it out on the connection card, and we would love to talk to you about baptism. Membership class uh, was postponed and delayed uh, to October 18th at 6.30. So if you are interested in being a member of Territorial Drive Alliance Church, if you want to learn more about this church, how we operate, and you just want to be more involved, uh, please, again, you can fill out your connection card, you can talk to any of the staff, and we would love uh, to get you connected 
with this church and hope that this is your home church. Um, Gospel Sing Along is October 17th at 1.30, so that's not this Tuesday, that's the next Tuesday. Uh, it's a great event, uh, so any seniors, retirees, uh, be a light to those that you know, right? Invite them to the Gospel Sing Along. There's snacks, there's awesome fellowship, and it's just a great afternoon. Um, oh, and then um, Christmas Banquet Tales... Not tails. I don't know where tails even came from. Christmas banquet tickets go on sale. Maybe I got confused with sale and tail. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but they go on sale October 15th. So next week, our Christmas banquet t- tickets will be on sale. We'll talk more about that next week. But for some of you, you got to get them right away. There might be a lineup at the church. Connie's going to show up at the church, and it's going to be like a line of a people. It's going to be great. But that is next week that they go on sale. And also, we do have daily bread uh, available at the Info Center. If you are looking, if you are wanting, feel free to grab one from them. All right, I think that about covers it for announcements. I'm going to invite Pastor Keith up for the message. You turn there, please. But before we do that, I want to take a moment in prayer. I want to pray for our missionaries this morning specifically. Um, they are in different places around the world. And I also want to invite you silently to pray for the nation of Israel. As you all know, it once again has become a war zone. And over the years since the beginning of almost time, that area that The Bible has described to us as the promised land is under conflict again, and we need to pray. So I'm going to open it up in prayer, then I'm going to give you some time in silence to pray as God leads you to pray for that part of the world. Um, 
that is, has been so influential and is such an area of potential conflict broader than just the nation itself. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us and this Thanksgiving weekend. Um, if we were to sit down and make a list of everything we're thankful for, Lord, that list would be um, really, really long. Lord, you've given us a land to live in that, that is peaceful. You've given us a land of plenty. Lord, compared to the majority of the world, um, we live in one of the wealthiest nations around. And so, Lord, cause us to be people that are, that are generous, that are giving, that are free to use what we have to encourage and bless and support others. And Lord, today, as once again, as uh, all over the world, there are wars constantly happening. Once again, we pray for the war in Ukraine. Lord, we pray for your will to be, to be done there and bring an end to that war. And Lord, in um, North Africa and so many places, there are conflicts. And yet it seems, Lord, that when something that happened that broke out yesterday in the land of Israel... It seems like, to me anyway, that it's just so much more magnified. And so we pray, and I ask you to pray right now. Heavenly Father, thank you that no matter what the plans of man are, you accomplish your purposes. So we pray that you would accomplish your purposes in the Middle East. Your will be done. In the name of Jesus glorified. And God, that people would be protected. Today, Lord, we want to submit to you our missionaries. We thank you for Heather and Andres. We thank you for Jen. We thank you for Pat, Isaiah and Tiana, Paul and Joanne. Lord, may they today be enriched spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, as they have been pouring out serving you. Um, as most of them are away from their families at this time, Lord, would they be encouraged on this Thanksgiving weekend. We submit ourselves to you, Lord, as we look into your word. We thank you for your word that opens our eyes and that illuminates us, and we pray that today uh, you would do just that through Philippians 2. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So way back when I was in Bible college in 1982, I was a freshman and I went to Prairie Bible Institute. And one of the um, requirements of when you go to Bible college back then in the day, I don't know if it's the same today, but you had to do student work. It was called gratis work and it was part of getting a reduction of your tuition. So by the time I got there, uh, there wasn't a lot of places left to sign up for. And one of the ones that caught my eye was the custodian of the men's gymnasium at the time. And so I signed up to be the custodian of the gymnasium. I walked into the gym for the first time, and right on the wall as you walk in was a massive sign that said, attitude affects everything. So you think about that. Sports teams come in, some visiting teams, different Bible colleges, rivalries happening. Briarcrest and Prairie was a massive rivalry at that time. And attitudes affected everything. You get fouled with an elbow in your eye and you're playing basketball, guess what's going to happen? your attitude may be triggered. So I got to learn as I was basically in that gymnasium five, six days a week, uh, prepping and cleaning and watching some games that uh, I saw a lot of potential for attitudes, good and bad. Paul is talking about the attitude of Jesus in Philippians chapter two and also ours. And he's talking about the mind of Jesus which relates to us very clearly. So after giving an appeal on how to live in relationship with one another as believers in the body of Christ in verses 1 to 4, Paul then shifts and makes a very strong appeal. And he says this in Philippians chapter 2, have this mind among yourselves. Many translations say attitude. Have this attitude amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now it seems to me that everything in chapter 2 revolves around this key thought of the mind of Christ. Every activity we do actually stems from what goes into what begins in our mind. If our attitude is good, a person's activities usually will be good. And 
Paul instructs this church how to think and how to live. And he basically told them, think like Jesus thought. And then you'll live like he does. He did. And he drives this point home by describing the type of mind that Jesus had. And he already emphasized in chapter 1, verse 21, that that our life truly is Christ. For me to live is Christ. That's the purpose of my life, your life. Then he shifts that we are to think with the mind of Christ, to think like Jesus shifts, or Jesus thinks. Because if Jesus gets the control of our mind, what does he have control of then? Our thoughts, our actions, our words, which changes a lot in life, would you not agree? Think about what Paul said in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. By the way, if you didn't know, if you didn't read your bulletin, this is Pastor Dirk's favorite passage in the Bible, correct? Here we go. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The way we change to become more like Jesus is by the renewing of our mind. And the goal is to become more like Jesus. And because we still have a battle going on in our minds, constantly, because we're wrestling against the spiritual, um, the flesh that's inside of us still, we have this battle going on. It is imperative that we relinquish everything to Christ's way of thinking. And this will be an ongoing challenge till our last breath. Now, because Jesus is God, You think, he has a way of thinking that is beyond our comprehension, because he's God. And yet the same Jesus, that's Lord of Lords, King of Kings, every time an individual opens their heart to Jesus Christ and receives him as personal Lord and Savior, that almighty God person comes and lives with inside of them. And it's beyond our comprehension. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, for who has understood the mind of the Lord? Who can understand it as to instruct him? Then he says this revolutionary statement, but we have the mind of Christ. And so you say, how do I get that kind of way of thinking? How do I get his mind? You may be thinking right now, you don't know my mind. My mind goes everywhere. My thoughts go everywhere. Sometimes I can't control my thoughts. My mind has a mind of its own. There's so much demanding its attention. And there is, and I'm just like you. So let's go back. Let's look at where we get the mind of Christ. We come into the possession of the mind of God at the time of regeneration, at the time of salvation, when we're born again by the Holy Spirit, where we come to the cross, we repent of our sin, we die to self, and we receive the life of Jesus given to us, and the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us permanently. Peter said this, by which he has granted to us his Precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Did you know that? When you received Christ, you became a partaker of the divine nature. God himself living inside of you, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. And when this happens, it begins a process that we call progressive sanctification, where we allow that divine nature, God himself, to progressively gain influence, and take control of our lives. So I want to look at three aspects of the mind of Christ this morning. Number one, let's look at his pre-existent state. Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 5 and 6, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, prior to Jesus' incarnation as a human being, prior to what we celebrate at Christmas, It says he was in the form of God. And this phrase refers to his pre-existence. The eternal son was with the Father and the Holy Spirit way before he showed up in Bethlehem. Way before. John 1.1 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word we know from later on in John is Jesus. And he continues, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Not only did Jesus exist from all eternity as truly God, along with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, he made everything. 
He's the creator of the universe. And when Jesus was on earth, he prayed in John 17, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. His eternal glory pre-existed his incarnation. Now, the word form here means a true and exact nature of something. The theologians created a term called hypostatic union. And I always got that word hypostatic mixed up with hydrostatic because I grew up as a farmer and, you know, if you have a hydrostatic, hydrostatic transmission, you know, it, it's hypostatic. That might help you remember. Where Jesus was fully God, fully man, and had all the characteristics of both. So therefore, having the form of God, he was equal with God, which is the direct contrast of what we'll read just in a few minutes, where it says he took upon the form of a servant. See, you see, the Son of God is and always has been God. Hebrews said this, he is the radiance of, of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe with the word of his power. When a person received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior into my life, into your life, when I did when I was seven years old, Jesus, the Lord of the universe, takes up residence in us for the purpose of making us more like himself. So that's his pre-existence. Number two, let's look at Christ's subjection to the Father. The decision to leave his position of glory in heaven and descend into a state of humiliation was a voluntary decision Jesus made. In 2 Corinthians 8, it said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Back to verse 6, Paul said, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. I want to read to you what the King James says. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery. I like that phrase, robbery to be equal with God. And so basically this means that Jesus did not view his position that he had with the Father and the Holy Spirit as something that required an act of robbery to hold on to it or maintain it in order to keep it or something to be held on to for his advantage. In other words, Jesus didn't insist on his own rights. But he willingly gave them up in order to come to earth and die on the cross for your sin of mine. And this is one of the aspects of the kind of mind of Christ that he calls us to have. All of our rights were taken to the cross. We gave them to God. So number one, under this subjection theme, I want to talk about the reason of Christ's subjection. What caused Jesus to come out of the glorious eternal heavens to a sinful world. What caused him to do that? And there's one word. That one word is love. The reason he did that, because he loves us. And the kind of love, there's four Greek terms to describe love in the Bible. We have one in English, and then we kind of have to decipher it from there. But one of those four words for love is phileo, which is a brotherly love or a reciprocal love. Jesus did not come with that kind of love, even though he exuded that in his life. He came with the agape form of love, which is the kind of love that always seeks the other person's highest good, which is not a two-way love. You could call it a one-way love. And it's described like this in 1 Corinthians. You hear this at weddings all the time. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That's the kind of love Jesus came. That's why he was willing to leave heaven for us. And that simply describes that passage, the mind of Christ, and the mind and the actions we are to have. Secondly, what is the extent of Christ's subjection? Let's read on in verse 7. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, 
Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let's look at that phrase, emptied himself, for a few minutes. In the original language, it also means to give up status and privilege. So we need to ask, what does that mean? What is Paul saying by that? Paul is not saying that Jesus became less than God for a time. Or that he gave up any of his divine attributes. Nor is he saying that, nor is he discussing or debating whether Jesus was all powerful or all knowing during his time on earth. Of course he was. Nor is he saying that Jesus ever gave up being in the form of God. Jesus could not give up his eternal natures, his inner qualities of his eternal nature. Rather, what Paul is saying is that even though Christ had all the privileges of being the king of the universe, he was willing to set them aside to become a Jewish baby headed for the cross. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. In the footnotes in my Bible, it says bond servant. You do a quick search on that, and it means a bond servant had no wages, owned no possessions, was owned by the owner, and had nothing of their own. This is the kind of servant Jesus came to be, born in the likeness of men. Did he have every right to stay in a position of power? Oh, you could say. But his love for sinful mankind drove him to accept this lowly position. And this emptying, emptied himself, really consists of becoming human, not of giving up any part of his deity. So here we have this amazing contrast. Jesus gave up the highest glory imaginable, creator and ruler of the universe, and took the lowest position imaginable. No majesty, no glory, no privileges, instead duties and obligations. A servant is not honored or served. A servant's role is to serve and honor others. And remember, God the Father did not do this emptying. It said Jesus emptied himself. He humbled himself. And there's a huge difference between being humiliated and willingly humbled, humbling himself. You see, he took this position because he loves us. So I want to shift here a little bit. I want to talk to men. When I work with couples and preparing them for their wedding day, we spend time in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. And we read that passage of the wife's role and the men's role. And we focus on the men's role. And Ephesians 5 says this to a husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so we spend some time asking and dialoguing, what does this mean for a husband to love like Jesus loved? Well, it's to become the type of servant that Jesus was. It's to give up our rights. To sacrifice to do things when we don't feel like doing things. He, he gave himself up for her. And what Jesus eventually did is he went to the cross. And so when I sit with a couple and I look at the man in the eyes, the question he needs to come, come to terms with is, is this the type of love I am prepared to give to my wife? To the death. And the goal for any couple coming into a marriage is to understand God's plan for marriage as best as possible as they can at that time so that they know what they're getting into. You see, Jesus' attitude was that of a servant. And you see, the Bible has so much to say about pride and humility. We can only touch on a surface of it. Jesus said this in Matthew 23. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. James 4 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's look at the humility of this subjection that Jesus came to as he emptied himself. You know, it was remarkable that the Son of God would take a form of a human being in a broken world. But Jesus went even much farther. He became obedient. I want to read Romans 5, 19. It says, For as one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, Jesus, 
the many will be made righteous. Paul says, Jesus came and he emptied himself, lived as a servant to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's how Jesus died. When we come to the end of our days, and for my family, it was working and walk, walking with my mother through those end of life, that end of life season. So when someone passes away, often what happens is a surviving family member or group will write what's called an obituary. And it gets posted online with the funeral home website or, and placed in the news optimist. So we did that with my mother. And sometimes you'll read this in the obituary he or she passed away peacefully, surrounded by his or her loving family. And when you're living, you, you kind of say, well, you know, that sounds like a good goal of how to die. But folks, I think only a small percentage actually have that happen of human beings on this planet. Whether it's sudden deaths or whether it's tragic deaths, whether it's um, whatever. Jesus could have decided he wanted to die a normal death with friends and family close by comforting him as he passed away. But he didn't. In one final step of his humbling, he died as only the very worst criminals did, by crucifixion and publicly. It was the total opposite of the divine majesty of the pre-existent Jesus. It was the ultimate expression of his submission and subjection to his father. And here we're given an amazing insight into the mind of Jesus. The death on a Roman cross was invented by the Romans and was intended to be the most humiliating, humiliating experience possible, to be used for the most despicable of criminals. Romans tended not to crucify their own citizens, instead saved that form of death for slaves, for disgraced soldiers, foreigners, Christians, and God. The Bible says that a person who, hang, who hangs on a tree is cursed. Galatians 3 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This is what the God of the universe chose to do for you and for me. He was willing to undergo that because of his love for us. He sought our highest good. He gave up his glory, took the form of a man, and died the worst possible death. Only the perfect, sinless Son of God with a selfless mind and heart would compel him to do this. So on the cross, Jesus gave himself for us. But then, he gives himself to us. Writer Theodore Epp said that. Because we are his followers, we possess him. And the goal is to allow him to have full control. Let's move to his exaltation. Number one, his pre-existence. Two, his subjection. Three, now his exaltation. Philippians 2 said this, verse 9. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Beyond what anyone could ever conceive, Christ's humiliation from God to servant to death, death on the cross, his exaltation was far beyond that you could, anyone could ever imagine. And by humbling himself on the cross out of love, he showed that he truly possessed the divine nature of God because God is love. John said it this way, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And how does he show it? By hanging on a cross. For this reason, therefore, God raised him to life and exalted him, entrusting him with the rule of the cosmos, and giving him the name that is above every name. Following his death and resurrection, Jesus said this, of so some of his last words, Matthew 28. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not that long before, he was hanging on the cross with no authority over anybody, practically. 
Now he's saying, all authority has been given to me. In Philippians 2, verse 8, 5 to 8, Jesus is the one on whom the focus is that Paul is writing. But in verse 9 to 11, now the focus shifts to the Father. This is what the Father is doing. He's rewarding Jesus for his humility, for his sacrifice. You see, the Father didn't humble Jesus. Jesus humbled himself, but the Father exalted his Son. Jesus didn't exalt himself. This is the kind of thinking he has that he says we are to have. He humbles himself, but he does not exalt himself. Let me venture into an area that is quite personal uh, for me and maybe for you. To a degree, all of us struggle with insecurities of various levels. And we inherit those maybe maybe from our family line, um, but we inherit them through our experiences as, as an individual, especially if you've experienced trauma of some kind in life. That results in a sense and a feeling of insecurity, and therefore we want to have security and control, which then results in different behaviors. But here's the deal. In our insecurity, the natural desire that I have is to promote myself to elevate myself so that I feel more secure. But here's the truth. We don't have to. I don't have to. Why is that? Because as a child of God, we are a precious, beloved, accepted, honored child of God. And I don't have to think I have to promote or exalt or prove myself. And you don't either because... Jesus is your ultimate value. And if God wants to exalt you in a human level, he'll do that. Let him take care of that. So, let's look at the different kinds of exaltation as we wrap up here. Number one, Christ's past exaltation. You can see this in three stages. When Paul wrote this letter in roughly A.D. 62 to 63, in a jail in Rome sending it to the Philippians, he could speak of the exaltation of Jesus had already, that had already taken place in the past. Because he said in verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him. Past tense. What was that exaltation? The resurrection of Jesus. Acts 2, Peter said this in his sermon. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus' exaltation, as Paul wrote it, had already taken place. But then there's a present exaltation of Jesus. Verse 9, it says, and God bestowed on him the name that is above every name. I want to read to you a beautiful passage from Philippians or Ephesians chapter 1. Here it is. According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in all, in all who fills him, fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1 verse 19 to 23. To sit at the right hand of God was a privilege beyond the highest privilege. This is where Jesus sits currently. Notice that Jesus was given the name that is above all names. In early Hebrew times, many would feel that the name of God, Yahweh, was so sacred and full of majesty that this name was not worthy for them to pronounce it. And so they substituted other names. In ancient times, a name was the sum of somebody's fame. So let's ask, how famous was Jesus? How famous was the Son of God? Well, we're told that God gave him the name that is above every name. It's the greatest name ever. On earth, Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, gave him a name, and it was explained what that name means in Matthew 1. She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus was known far and wide throughout the Middle East. People flocked from all over the nation to hear him. But his, na- his fame was still fleeting. How do we know that? Because he got crucified. But today, 
His name fills the heavens, and that name is above every name. So then we ask the question, and I think we already have the answer. In Exodus 20, verse 7, why did God put this command in the Ten Commandments? That we shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. I think it's because that name is so glorious, it's so holy, it's so above every name. Why would we do that? Now let's look to Christ's future exaltation. It says in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So this is coming down the road. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For those who know Jesus as Savior, when he comes, he will come as King, as Savior, as Redeemer. And he will deliver us from this sinful, cursed world. And that will be a welcome sight for all of us. But what about those who do not know Jesus as their Savior? What about them? It says every knee should bow. Even those who have rejected Jesus Christ will eventually admit that he is Lord. In my finite thinking, I try to think through what that will look like or feel like. Even though many now will despise the name of Jesus, mock it, say it in vain, but one day, they will admit that he truly is the Lord of all, the creator of the universe, the savior and the king of kings. And they will admit that Jesus Christ is superior over everyone and everything. Verse 10 identifies the three types of knees that will bow. Knee bowing has always been seen as a sign of significance and honor and value and submission. So number one, things in heaven. So this refers to the countless number of angels that are all around us all the time. Heavens around earth will bow. Number two, things on earth refers to every single human being that's breathed on this planet. Saved or unsaved, every tongue, every knee will bow. And thirdly, things under the earth referring to Satan himself and all of his demonic forces will bow. No one is excluded and so from this we see two potential outcomes when this reality happens that Paul is talking about when Jesus returns. Number one, there will be comfort for those who are God's children. And number two, there will be terror and condemnation to those who are not. If you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Please do not delay. Because one day it will be too late. One day every human being on this planet will acknowledge him as Lord. Whether he is their savior or whether he is their judge. I want to talk to us followers of Christ for a moment. Even though we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and as a result, we will avoid God's wrath against our sin. We will someday give an account of how we've lived our lives. 2 Corinthians 5 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This judgment, and there's a variety of them, this judgment is called the judgment seat of Christ. It's not about sin, that's been taken care of in the cross, but it's about how we lived our lives, and as a result, rewards will be given. Some great reward, some little reward. But then there's another judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. And this is a whole different matter for unbelievers. The great white throne judgment has one direction where it goes. Because it seals the destiny of those who have not surrendered to Christ. And Revelation 20 gives a stark reality of what that will look like. And at the end, at the end of that section, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 15, it says these words. And this grips me, folks. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire and cast into hell to live forever. The reason that's gripping is because I don't want anybody I know to go there. But Philippians 2.11 says, everyone will admit that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And the purpose of that is to the glory of the Father. Throughout the ages from eternity past, since creation, God's purpose has been to bring glory to himself. While Jesus was on earth, he brought his Father glory. The purpose of salvation is to bring glory to the Father. And even those who reject Jesus after it's too late for them, that act of admitting that Jesus Christ is the Lord brings glory to the Father. The, the extent of this exaltation is unmatched in all of history. Just like the extent of the humiliation of the Son of God was unmatched in all of history. May we never forget that Jesus went through this for us. So just as God exalted his Son. The whole purpose of Philippians 2, 1-11 is to cause us to live the way Jesus lived. And so 1 Peter says this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. He, wants, he wanted the churches that he wrote to to live this way, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. And not that I don't think we're supposed to yearn for that exalting, but we're thankful for how that works. So what do we do as a result? How do we have the same attitude in the mind of Jesus? Number one, I think it's a simple ask. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Ask, Lord, give me the mind of Christ. Secondly, I think we need to choose something. Just like we learned, Jesus chose to humble himself and empty himself. So a prayer that we pray would be, Lord, I humble myself before you. I submit myself to you. I resist the devil. And then there's other practical things like spiritual disciplines of allowing the words of Christ to shape and form our thinking. Habits of prayer, habits of fellowship, habits of contemplation. And then the final thing that I would invite us to do is to look around wherever you go and ask, Lord, give me your eyes. Every single person that you see today, wherever you go, will, chapter 2, verse 10, will one day do this. Every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. How can we help them see Jesus now? Theodore Epp writes a poem written by a converted atheist and it expressed his thoughts as he reflected on the name of Jesus. He said this, I tried in vain a thousand ways, my fears to quell, my hopes to raise, but what I need, the Bible says, is ever only Jesus. My soul is night, my heart is steel, I cannot see, I cannot feel. For light, for life, I must appeal in simple faith to Jesus. He died, he lives, he reigns, he pleads. There's love in all his words and deeds. There's all a guilty sinner needs forevermore in Jesus. Though some should sneer and some should blame, I'll go with all my guilt and shame. I'll go to him because his name above all names is Jesus. In the weeks, months, years before my mother's passing, my sister, Kathy, created a series of videos with my mother over the past few years mostly to brighten my mom's day, but also to share her life with other people. I want to show you one, just a brief one, uh, on Thanksgiving. This is the first Thanksgiving I've had in 58 years without a parent, without my mom. Many of you have lived through many of those, but this is new for me. But it's also the first Thanksgiving my mom has had this experiencing in heaven. And I don't know if that calendar works like that in heaven at all. I don't know. But I want you to watch this, and I'm going to pray. So we asked ourselves a question the other day. I asked you, what will be the first thing you'll say to Jesus when you get to heaven? Thank you. Yep. That's about it. That's, that's a good thought. And then... Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, from the beginning of time, it said Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 
And we were even known before we were created. Jesus knew who we were and what name we would be given. And Father, when we look at the scope of your plan of salvation that involved your Son and the Holy Spirit and the action by which Jesus took to accomplish that plan by humbling himself as a bond servant, dying in the cross for our sins. God, we are so thankful. May that be the theme of our Thanksgiving weekend. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me from the sin that grips me now and for the judgment that would grip all of eternity. Thank you that we're free from that judgment as a follower of Jesus. And God, I would pray that today, those here, those watching online, if they have not made that firm decision that Jesus truly is Savior, oh God, lead them to say, Jesus, I need you. I realize your love for me. I need you to forgive my sins. I need to be free from this burden that I'm carrying. I want you to take it. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. I choose to allow you and give you the title, Lord of my life. So, Father, we choose as a family of believers to humble ourselves before you, and you can do the exalting however you please. But today, this Thanksgiving weekend, we just say thank you for what you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's praise God together today.
And now may Christ, who is adored in the highest heaven, the everlasting Lord, the Prince of Peace and Mighty God, the name above all names, fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving.